those words pierce into ours. And let us leave here um, having grown closer to you than we were when we walked in. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Before uh, Tim comes this morning, I want to try something. I want to do a video, just of a short video of you guys saying hi to uh, Josh Bunce, to a professor. And so I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, would you guys just say, hi, Josh, OK? I'm going to try this. Let's practice. Ready? One, two, three. Hi, Josh. OK, you ready? Oh, my. <laughs> I got to get you all in here. OK, let's do it twice. So this morning, our speaker is Tim Hawkins. Uh, Tim is the VP of Academic Services on our campus. Normally, his wife, Jana, might come to introduce him or to read scripture, uh, but I reached out to her today. She wasn't able to be here. But these are some words that she wrote about Tim this morning. This is Tim's 13th year at Berkeley. He loves to find funny jokes to put our kids to bed, and he loves solitude, which is only funny because we have so many kids. He loves to travel, camp, hike, and kayak. It took me 17 years of marriage to get him to drink coffee, and now 19 years in, he drinks more than I do. His favorite sport teams are the Royals, Chiefs, Seahawks, K-State Wildcats, and this is something I was very excited to hear. And he will cheer for KU if they're not playing K-State, so this is good to know. He has a big heart, a great laugh, and a fierce loyalty, and I am so blessed to be his partner. I wish I could be there today. Would you guys welcome Tim this morning? I got about 15 people I want you guys to say hi to, so give me a second, get my, no, just kidding. <laughs> I think she must have said I like to tell funny jokes, like in quotes or italics, because I'm, I'm in full-on dad joke mode these days. Um, here's a picture of the family, that's kind of dark. Um, <clears throat> can we turn lights on at all, Casey, to help me, yeah, it's too much worse, no. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'll try to, I'll try to, I brought you, gave me some kind of suggestions for what to talk about in chapel, and I'm actually not going to do any of those things, but uh, I know she talked about, um, you know, having this theme of stories this semester, and I thought, well, I'll just tell you a little bit of our story, um, even though Jana's intro kind of did some of that. Um, this is our family um, camping last summer, last spring, um, I don't know, working kind of I guess you're left to right. Tiffany uh, is one of our foster kids, and then she's on Jan's lap, and then Joseph is uh, next to her. He's our other foster uh, son. And then Silas is the big one in the middle, and Sophia is sitting on his lap, and Sophia is, um, we were able to adopt her. She was our foster daughter, and we were able to adopt her last February, right before quarantine happened and through the world in chaos. So there was at least one good thing that came out of 2020 is uh, her adoption. And then you have Lex and Ben and me. Um, I've been married for 19 years, as Janet's intro mentioned. We've lived in Haviland for 12 and a half of those years. Uh, and we moved here from Anchorage, Alaska, after living there for three years. That's always kind of a fun novelty to throw out there. Uh, I've been teaching at Berkeley since we moved here. So this is, um, I think, my 27th semester at Berkeley. I teach English and Lit. I became the VP for academics uh, three years ago and was the associate VP before that. And so that's kind of my story. Um, that's how we got where we are today. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about today is, um, are we missing a slide there? I feel like we're missing a slide. Am I, uh, can you help me out, Casey? Oh, 
the title slide in black. While he's looking, let me pray for those guys in for me. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that you'd call my nerves, that you'd help this to go well so that your word can come through clearly. I pray that uh, this time would be a blessing for all of us together, that we could rest in the notion that there's nothing we can do here in the next half an hour that will uh, make you love us more or that will cause you to love us less. So help us to um, cling to that, uh, help me to communicate well, and help us to have open minds to hear what you need, uh, what you need me to say. Amen. Ah, uh, there it is. So I'm actually going to talk to you guys um, about academics. I'm the VP of academics, and we're starting a new semester. Uh, so it may seem kind of strange to talk about academics in chapel, but I'll try to make some connections for you. I know Brock had talked about, uh, maybe you talk a little bit about foster care. Um, but frankly, this is a hard thing for me to talk about, foster care is. Um, it's a hard thing for me to talk about because it exposes a lot of my own flaws, and those are hard to deal with. Um, it's, you know, foster care is only necessary because of humanity's humanness, the messiness of humans. Um, so that makes it hard to talk about. It points to the reality that suffering is a part of the Christian experience. Um, I remember Brock and I talking once, and she said something like, we don't have a good theology of suffering. And I think when I try to talk about foster care, that's what I run into sometimes, is I don't, uh, it, it feels wrong to say that being a foster parent is suffering, but there are times when it feels that way. And so I'm not, I'm not well equipped to talk about that. Maybe I'm too much in the experience now to have a good perspective to reflect on, you know, the significance of foster care to us as Christians. So I, I, I think that was one of the things I realized as I was thinking about what I might talk to you guys about. Is I'm not prepared to talk about foster care, but one thing I might be prepared to talk about is uh, academics. Um, and so in order to get us off on the right foot academically this semester, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about, um, this will take us through kind of three different viewpoints. I'm going to start at kind of 30,000 feet, and then we'll zoom into some nuts and bolts, and then we'll zoom back out as we talk about academics. But in order to, if you're thinking like, it, it seems weird to talk about academics in chapel, um, let me talk a little bit about why I think you should care about this. First of all, you absolutely belong here. We need to establish this out of the gates. When I say here, I mean at Barclay College. So without raising your hand, um, I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions, and you can like mentally raise your hand. How many of you guys are first-generation college students, meaning you are the first of your family to attend college? Again, you don't need to raise your hand. I'm just asking. How many of you come from poverty? How many of you have experienced trauma that constantly puts you on edge? How many of you didn't do so well in high school? How many of you are new Christians? All of these things and more can lead to a kind of imposter syndrome that can lead you to believe that I don't belong at Berkeley College. All of these things are things that can make you think you belong in the margins and not here. I'm telling you that I have seen students who come from all of those scenarios and they excel at Berkeley by doing things that good students do. Do not let your past tell you that you are an imposter here. You belong here. Which leads to my next point. You absolutely are supposed to be here. As of right now, God has called you here at this time for a specific reason. I'm not saying that God can't redeem failure, but I'm quite confident that God did not call you here to waste this academic opportunity. So trust that he's called you here for a reason. Trust that you're supposed to be here. And then work to figure out what that reason is. And I'm guessing the academics has a significant piece to that. Finally, the reason it feels appropriate to talk about academics in chapel is because academics are a form of worship. Amen. In that great Quaker tradition, every aspect of our lives are an act of worship. When we scoop eggs onto our plate for breakfast in the cafeteria, that's an act of worship. When we step onto the court or onto the field, that's an act of worship. When we walk our dog or put a puzzle together or perform in the musical, these are all acts of worship. These are all ways of you reflecting who God is, who God has made you to be. When you step into the classroom, you're worshiping your creator. So you're expressing your reverence for him and your dependence upon him 
And so it's fitting that we talk about academics in chapel because it's a form of worship. All right, so with that established, let's get into some, uh, some of this. Oh, this, uh, this one last piece about academics is worship. This is a uh, you know, stained glass of Bernard of Clairvaux. And maybe you guys have seen this quote before. I know Dave Williams, when he had an office here on campus, did this was one of the signs in his office. Um, and Bernard of Clairvaux supposedly said, those who seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge, that is curiosity. Now, there's nothing wrong with being curious. In fact, in a minute, I'm going to tell you that I think curiosity is, is a key to being a good learner. But curiosity for curiosity's sake is ultimately unfulfilling. You find yourself saying, okay, I'm no longer curious about that. Now what? Um, it doesn't serve anyone but yourself, and even that satisfaction doesn't last very long. So knowledge just for the sake of knowledge is just curiosity. Those who seek knowledge to be known by others, that's vanity. If you are here at Berkeley College because you want to get a degree so other people pay attention to you, that's vanity. If you are here at Berkeley College to prove how smart you are, that's vanity. Those who seek knowledge in order to serve, that is love. That's what it's all about. Learning so that you can better serve others. That's what we've been called to do, to love others by serving them. Matthew 22, 37 through 39, this is when Jesus is being tested by the Pharisees. and he's being asked, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the Pharisees, like, you know, licking his chops, ready to answer, because he knows that's what Jesus is supposed to say as a good Jew. But before the Pharisee can jump in there with his reply, Jesus says, and the second command is like it. I can just imagine the Pharisee being like, wait, what? The second command? No, there's just one. I ask you about the greatest. Why are you giving me a second? And he says, the second is love your neighbor as yourself. So we're called to love. And knowledge in order to serve, that's love. Later on, Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So he ups the ante here a little bit. It's not just love each other as you would be loved. It's love each other as I have loved you. And he died on the cross for us. So this, this aspect of love, this is what it's all about. This is what Christ has commanded us to do. And finally, I'm reminded of our chapel verse. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all else, love each other deeply, for love covers over a multitude of sins. So as Bernard of Clairvaux has said, we go to class, I'm paraphrasing, we go to class and work hard so that we might serve each other. It's our mission, life, service, and leadership, because that's how we carry out Christ's command to us. So, this is uh, academics as worship. All right, so I'm going to start walk big here. Um, Sarah and Tal, would you guys uh, pass out those handouts? Um, we're going to start with this activity. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is how if you guys want to be good students, it's important that you make what you're learning, make it meaningful. Okay, so um, this is like our bigger picture perspective. I'm going to take us more close up to a nuts and bolts perspective in a minute, and then we'll zoom back out again. But the first strategy towards achieving academic success is to make what you're learning meaningful. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, what you'll find coming around here is a handout. Um, I want you guys to take this handout. I want you to read the instructions on the handout. Um, you'll need something to write with, so grab a pen or pencil. And uh, once all the handouts come around, we'll get going here. Um, this is an exercise designed to illustrate this idea of making sure you make, me uh, make meaning out of what you're learning. Um, while those are coming around, we're, what we're really going to talk about here is this idea of um, deep learning and shallow learning, or deep processing and shallow processing. And we know that good learning happens when you process information deeply. And the way we process information deeply is we make meaning out of it. So um, I don't know if you guys, yeah, they're coming around. I think we'll kind of wait while that's happening. Oh, I forgot my list, so let me... Um, Hey, Derek, can you bring my coat to me real quick, please? It's the gray one right next to you. Yeah. Sorry, I need my, well, this is perfect while they're passing stuff out because I forgot something I need.
Okay. Who still needs a handout? I need more hands raised because I need to buy some time. <laughs> okay, okay. Who needs something to write with? Raise your hand if you need something to write with or a handout. I've got a couple up here who need something to write with. Shuttle's bringing them around. Okay, so read your instructions on your handout. Do you guys have the handout? Okay. All right, so again, uh, there's some up here who need something to write with. Raise your hand again if you need something to write with. Ooh, lots in here. You guys should bring a pen to chapel. You never know when the moment's going to strike. All right, I probably could have thought this out a little better, but here we go. Anybody else still need something to write with? I think we needed two up here, Sarah. Anyone else? Beyonce, did you need a pen or something? Okay. Anybody else? All right. So read your instructions. Oh, we need one over here. Oh, we need the handout. Do you need the handout? I'm sorry, Brock. I didn't mean to give you a workout this morning. Okay. Are we good? All right. So here's, what, here's what's going to happen. You guys have instructions at the top of your sheet. I'm going to lead you, read you a list of 24 words. Back up. We've done this before, so this will be kind of familiar to you. But for everybody else, it should be most new. Um, I'm going to read you a list of 24 words, and you just follow the instructions on your sheet and check yes or no. Okay? So uh, we'll move pretty quick through these words, but are we ready? Good? Okay, here we go. I'm going to start reading these words. First word is evening. Second word, country. Salt. Easy. Fifth word is peace. Sixth word is morning. Okay. Pretty. Eight is expensive. Poor. Doctor. Eleven is city. City. Twelve is dry. Thirteen is cold. Love. Bargain. Sixteen is war. Hate. Hate. Eighteen is wet. Rich. Twenty is nursed. Pepper. Pepper. Twenty two is hard. Twenty three is ugly. And finally, hot. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. And you need, I'm trying, you've got to be honest here. Okay. Flip your sheet over. And write down as many of those words as you can recall. Don't, don't cheat. Don't share. Just do this from your own memory.
Okay, there's nothing at stake here. I'm not going to give a prize to anybody, so don't, there's no incentive to uh, fudge here. All right. Uh, I'm going to actually read through the list real quick so you can check to see if you're right. Cross out any that you somehow imagine. Don't add to your list. All right, here we go. Here are the, here are the words again in lightning fashion. Evening, country, salt, easy, peace, morning, pretty, expensive, poor, doctor, city, dry, cold, love, bargain, war, hate, wet, rich, nurse, pepper, hard, ugly, hot. Okay. Everybody stand up. If you remembered less than six, have a seat. No shame, no shame. If you remembered uh, less, less than nine, so if you got nine, stay standing, less than nine, have a seat. If you remember 12, or less than 12, have a seat. 15. Okay, so that eliminates that side. We still have a number on this side. Um, if you had 12, go ahead and stand back up for a second. 12 or more, go ahead and stand back up. You guys notice something here? This side is dumb. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Hey, so tell me, uh, what, what you guys don't know is there are actually two sets of instructions, okay? So, Mikhail, tell me what yours said. When I was reading the words, what were you supposed to be looking for? Okay, you guys were looking to decide, did this word have an E, a letter E, or a letter G in it? Okay? What were you guys talking about? What was yours? Oh, okay. So, can, can you... Check yes if the word is pleasant or no if the word isn't pleasant. Okay? So you guys were looking for letters E or G. You guys were deciding whether a word is pleasant or not. You guys can have a seat. Do you see what happens when you automatically try to think about, is this word pleasant to me? Rather than looking at like bits and pieces, this is shallow processing. You're not actually making any sense of it. You're just looking. This would be like if you just memorized a term. You just memorized a definition. Or if you remember, if you remember what page a term was on. Oh, I remember that term was in that, that chart we had on page you know, 27. This is deep processing. This is deep learning. You're actually attaching meaning to this word. You're making a concept. So this is my point here. Learning happens when you guys attach meaning to the material. Okay? There's another form of that experiment, by the way, where they actually split the room into, into quad into fours. And have uh, one quadrant is the EG group, but they are told they're going to be quizzed over those words. The other group is the EG, and they're not told about the quiz. One quarter says, is it pleasant or not? And they're not told about the quiz. And one quarter is, is it pleasant or not? And you're going to be quizzed on these. And they found that even the pleasant or not, who did not know there was a quiz coming, performed better than the EG, who did know there was a quiz coming. So that's my point, is if you attach meaning to material, then it, it sticks in your brain. So how do we do this? So this is what Stephen Chu says. He's a professor at Samford, and he's the one that came up with this experiment. He says, if you think about information meaningfully, you're much more likely to remember that information than you think about it if you think about it on a superficial level, regardless of whether you intend to learn the material or not. So I tell the professors, you can say, so you're blue in the face, hey, pay attention, this is important, but if students aren't making meaning of that, that doesn't matter. attach new material to stuff that you already know. Let me give you a, a brief example, and then I'll kind of give you some more practical. Um, I, I grew up playing baseball. I grew up listening to baseball on the radio. Um, I, grew, I, I started playing fantasy baseball uh, when I was 13 years old, and have done that now for, you know, 27, almost three decades. Um, and I grew up collecting baseball cards and looking at the stats on the back of baseball cards. And so for me growing up, RBIs runs batted in. 
and home runs and uh, fielding percentage and stolen base, all of those things made perfect sense to me. When I saw the little uh, abbreviation, I knew exactly what they meant, and I could, I could make meaning out of that because I'd grown up playing the game. I did not grow up watching the NBA. Um, I watched a lot of college basketball, but when it comes to now like analytics on the NBA level, and I see a stat like per, any NBA fans out here? Per. What does per mean? Can you know? Can you, can player efficiency rating is a measure of how efficient they are. What's a good number? Anybody know what a good number is? A good per number? I don't know. I could see a number and I wouldn't know if that was a good number or not. I mean, I could see a ranking and I could tell, but I don't have any context for that. So when new analytical stats come out in basketball, I don't have anything to attach it to. And so it's less meaningful for me. But baseball, when something like war wins, uh, wins above replacement or something like fit, fielding independent pitching, things like that, those new analytical stats, I, I can make sense of that because I can attach it to the old stuff. So what does this look like for you guys? When you're engaging in new material, think back to your experience of the world or what you learned in previous classes. So questions you can ask. For example, let's imagine you're in abnormal psychology and you're learning about eating disorders. A question might be, how does this inform what my friend was going through in high school, or maybe what you were going through in high school? How does this textbook discussion of eating disorders jive or not jive with my own experience of that? And the minute you attach that to your experience, the more meaningful that material becomes, and it'll stick in your brain. How does this discussion of the book of Revelation in eschatology, Derek, how does that complement or contradict that sermon I heard earlier about the end times? Those of you who've had intro to lit, you've got a raisin in the sun together. How does Walter Younger's experience as a young black man in a raisin in the sun mirror or diverge from my own experience as a young black man? Not mine. So the minute you attach these new stuff to old stuff is when you start to make that learning stick. I think this is often why math is so difficult, by the way, because it's hard to attach mathematical concepts to old stuff that we already know. The really good math teachers can make that and help you take this strange foreign concept and uh, attach it to something that's not so foreign. So my encouragement to you is take time to consider how this new material informs or connects to old material. Okay, how else do we make it meaningful? My recommendation is to employ active reading strategies. You make meaning when you don't just let the stuff wash over you. All right, so marginalia, write in the margins. Take notes. If something seems interesting to you, note that. Don't just highlight. Write in the margins why you thought it was important to highlight. I'm going to encourage you to have a conversation with the text. If the text says something you disagree with, note your disagreement. Maybe you've never heard that before. Note your surprise. And then I'm going to encourage you to look up words you don't know. If you can't figure out the context, go look that up. You guys, the nice thing is we all have a dictionary next to us while we're reading. It's our phone. Of course, this takes time, so you've got to give yourself a little time to do this. If you're trying to read 100 pages the night before the uh, reading is due, this probably isn't going to work as well for you. And then the last, the last recommendation I have in terms of making this meaningful is to, I, when, once you identify what God is calling you to do, view everything you learn through that lens. I love it when psychology majors are taking intro to lit and we start reading a story and they, uh, they are unpacking that story through, say, family systems theory. I love it when students understand their calling and they start asking questions. How is my calling to be in elementary school informed by what I'm learning in philosophy? Once you feel confident you know what God is calling you to do, and this is often marked by you declaring a major, once you feel confident what God is calling you to do, then view the new material through that lens. It will give you something to attach it to. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, that's kind of a, that's making it meaningful. That's 30,000 foot some strategies to help do that. Let's talk about... Um, Let's get, let's zoom in now. Let's talk about some more nuts and bolts kind of practical ways to help you achieve academic success this semester. Uh, my first suggestion is consider taking notes by hand as opposed to having your laptop open. Um, this isn't even talking about the distraction that comes with a laptop. This is more talking about just practically. What happens is uh, good research has shown that when we try to take notes on computer, 
computer, we generally almost transcribe what our professor is saying, almost word for word. And the act of that transcription is really what it gets back to is that does it have an E or a G in it? Whereas if you're writing long form by hand, then you can't write fast enough to get everything word for word. And so you start to prioritize key phrases, key concepts. You take your own version of a shorthand and you put it in your notes. This is especially helpful if after class, in class, you kind of review your notes real quick and make sure you've got all these key concepts down. But taking notes by hand forces you to prioritize concepts, which leads to deep processing. So maybe give that a shot. Take notes by hand. My next is, if you have any, as a student at all, you know I talk about this a lot, and this is retrieval practice. Um, force your brain to recall information. Recall, recall, recall. Students can fool themselves. Okay, night before an exam, I would imagine a number of you will open up your notes and you will review your notes. Or maybe you will reread a chapter or a paragraph from a chapter to prepare for a test. And the research shows that's, that's a really inefficient way to study. What you need to do is force your brain to recall information. So it's like, a, I think of it like a messy filing cabinet. If the mess is always the same mess, the more you go into that filing cabinet, the more you remember where stuff is. And so the way this works with recall is make flashcards. Force yourself to recall the information. Write a mock quiz. Start a study guide with uh, your classmates and have them each contribute a question they think might be on the exam, and then you've got to answer those questions. Force your brain to recall information. Let me give you an example of how this, how, how I kind of, this was a hot moment for me. I make pancakes just about every Sunday for my kids. And for a long time, now I just use the mix because it's not because I'm lazy. I found out the mix is actually pretty good. Uh, but for a long time, I just made it for like, made my own mix from scratch. It's the same recipe. I swear I did this recipe 20 times. And yet, every time I went to make the recipe, I had to open up my phone and find the recipe on my phone. And so I started reading uh, James Lang. He's a professor at um, um, Assumption, Co Assumption College in, in Massachusetts. He's written a lot about learning. And he uh, gives this, uh, he was talking about retrieval. And so I, I started thinking, could I do this recipe from my own brain without the recipe in front of me? And I really struggled. Even though I'd done it like 20 times, but I'd never asked my brain to recall the recipe. I'd always just had it in front of me. Does that make sense? James Lang talks about when he was writing this book, he would go to the same Starbucks like almost daily to have a little bit of writing time. And one day he went up to the barista, he ordered the same thing every time. He ordered tea and something. He went up to the barista and said, I'll just have what I usually have. And she, she didn't know, even though he'd ordered from this barista dozens of times. And so he kind of forced her to think about it a little bit and recall his usual order. And the next time he went in there, he asked, he said, oh, you know, and she knew what drink it was because she'd been forced to recall that information. So as you guys think about studying for exams, recall, recall, recall. The other thing that, another thing that I'd recommend is predict what will happen next. Create some expectations. Um, there's a lot of research that talks about how you guys need to create models in order for something, even if the model is wrong, there's research that shows if your prediction was wrong, if you have a chance to correct that prediction, then that learning will stick. So if you're in science, some science class, and you're doing an experiment, before you do the experiment, predict what you think is going to happen. And then when your prediction turns out to be correct or incorrect, as long as it's incorrect and you fix it, then that learning will stick. If you're in one of my lit classes, based on what happens in Act 1, what do you think is going to happen in Act 2? If you're in the Old Testament survey, now that God has given the Israelites the Ten Commandments, what do you think they're going to do with that? Even if your predictions are wrong, research shows that first forming predictions, as long as you have a chance to correct those, is better than no prediction at all. It's what helps create the scaffolding for you to attach stuff to. In terms of the last bit of uh, nuts and bolts, I'm going to talk to you guys about test anxiety. Again, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you uh, experience test anxiety? Just kind of answer that question in your mind. You get nervous for tests. Do you think I'm, you've maybe uttered the phrase, I'm not a good test taker? Test anxiety is a real thing. Um, and so let me give you two strategies for, if you, if you find yourself, I'm not a good test taker, um, let me give you two strategies that maybe help address that issue. The first sounds kind of new age, but it's actually a pretty good spiritual discipline as well. This is mindful breathing. 
Uh, mindful breathing is simply finding a place in calm and quiet, paying attention to your breathing. They did a study on uh, students uh, as a test anxiety study, and they found students a week before a test, so just seven days before a test, they had those students, they trained them a little bit in mindful breathing, and they had those students set aside five minutes a day to do some mindful breathing, just paying attention to their breathing. It helps with regulation. And then when they took the exam, they found that those students had far less anxiety when they took the exam. So just five minutes, practice that a little bit. Again, I think this is a pretty important spiritual discipline as well. It's often where we listen to what God might have in store for us. And the other is cognitive reappraisal. That's just a fancy way of saying, make sure your expectations are realistic. Too many of us have doom and gloom expectations. We assume the worst is going to happen. I'm going to take this test. I'm going to fail. That means I'm going to flunk the class. I'm going to be kicked out of Barclay. I'm not going to get my degree. I'm going to have to go back home. And whatever that is, too many of us build this up in our mind that it's going to be the worst thing ever that's going to happen. So they did the same study. Um, they had these students do some cognitive reappraisal where they just um, shifted, they reframed their thoughts and helped them say, okay, if I don't do as well on this test, it's not the end of the world. For Christians, this is even easier because they say, you know, I can fail this test and God's still going to love me. I, as long as I'm putting forth my best effort, that's all I can do. So my, re- my recommendation is maybe some cognitive reappraisal. Help make sure that you're, you, you're reframing your thoughts so it's not the worst case scenario. And you'll find that your test anxiety will come down. All right. Uh, and then finally, this is really important. This is, this is maybe academics plus. Is don't neglect the basics as you guys are uh, go through the semester. Maybe you've heard the sacrum sweet. Um, the basics are sleep. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. Uh, the W is water. Make sure you're drinking enough water. E, one well, of the first E is exercise. Make sure you're getting enough exercise. The second is eating well. Make sure you eat well. And then the T is time. Make sure you set aside time to have some margin. I, I sometimes wonder if students, like, this This feels like the S is super small sometimes because <laughs> sleep seems to be one of the first things we can cut out of a busy schedule. And the T sometimes feels really big because, you know, sometimes we can escape what's hounding us by, you know, taking time for ourselves, playing video games or whatever that looks like. My recommendation is you keep those in balance. Keep them all the same font size, if you will. Don't neglect the basics. You'll be amazed at how, uh, how, better, how much better your learning goes if you can do those things in balance. All right, so now let's zoom back out. Um, I want to encourage you to buy in. That seems to be a word that's been on my mind for several years at Berkeley. Students who do well academically, and I would say students who excel beyond academics, they just buy in. And what I mean by buy-in is there's a bit of it's like um, not worrying too much about what people are going to say, about diving in uh, and embracing the Barclay experience. And so I think it's okay to be curious. I know I said like knowledge just for curiosity's sake is a problem, but I think it is okay to be curious. Too many of you guys have been sent this kind of too school, too cool for school message. It's not okay to show an interest in something that's not this other thing. It's okay. I love those students who are curious and who ask questions. And I love those students who get excited about what we're going to learn about. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not asking them to draw up excitement for things you're not excited about. What I guess what I'm asking for you is to not tamper down your excitement because you're worried about what the person next to you is going to say. I'll look foolish if I'm excited. I'll look foolish if I ask this question. I'll look foolish if I show some curiosity about this thing. And that drives me crazy. I think students really do themselves a disservice when they kind of censor themselves because they're worried about what other people might think. And I know that's a tough thing to overcome. Again, you've often been sent the message that it's not cool to be curious about something, or you're really making yourself vulnerable if you ask questions, and who wants to be vulnerable? But I'm, I'm giving you permission to buy in and move to these places and try to get past that it's not cool to do this kind of thing. Um, I think you'll find that your own learning is enhanced when you give yourself permission to do those things. And, and a new semester is a great chance to try this on for size. So that's my, uh, that's my spiel. That's my spiel for academics. I want to again bring it back where we started. Academics is a form of worship. God has called you to Barclay College. He's not asking you to throw this away. Don't throw away your shot. We listen to Hamilton. That was another good thing in 2020s. We listened to a lot of Hamilton in our house. But don't throw away a shot. God's called you here for a reason. So let's worship him well by taking this seriously and, uh, and doing the best we can.
Okay, let me pray for you guys. And I, Do you need anything else, Brocky? All right, I'll pray for you and dismiss you then. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to um, focus on academics as worship. May we worship you well. May we be responsible with what you've put in front of us. May we take seriously the fact that you've orchestrated this so that we could all be here in this spot. Um, uh, let me be humble about the fact that anyone could be the VP for academics if you called them to do it. And so the fact that you've chosen me is, is humbling. And I pray that, that I would take that seriously, that these students would take their responsibility as students seriously, and that the work that we do this semester would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.